hopefully this, you know, we can use this to uh, confuse later, later archaeologists. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is from the first two meditations of Descartes. <clears throat> what is Descartes' cogito? And then um, I want you to explain what this means and then explain what this might mean to, uh, you know, in the context of the thought experiment uh, of the brain in the vat idea or the evil genius thought experiment, whichever one appeals to you. And the second question will be the problem of evil. You know, what is it? And then I want you to list two potential resolutions that have been proposed and their counter arguments. And again, this is, um, you know, at least one counter argument per resolution. You don't have to list them all, you know, all of the counter arguments for each one. Okay, let's start. What is Descartes' cogito? Very good, Roscoe. I think, therefore, I am. So, uh, yeah, so cogito in Latin is I think. Um, you can also, you know, use cogito ergo sum. Um, if you're feeling really brave, you can use the French, je pense donc je suis. Um, and that's the limit of my languages. If you list it in something else, I may not get it. Uh, in which case, I would come back and ask you. <laughs> so, yeah, my Russian's a bit shaky. Uh, so, what is Descartes' cogito? I think, therefore, I am. So, in the meditations, Descartes wants to find some fundamental truth that he cannot doubt, that he must believe. And he goes through this really kind of interesting, almost kind of counterintuitive way of trying to doubt as many things as he can to find the at least one thing that he cannot doubt. Um, he does find other things that he, he can also not doubt, like the existence of God, but um, I think they're a little less, uh, oops, sorry about that. They're a little less, um, let's say, logically persuasive. Okay, so what does it mean? I think therefore I am. And what does that mean for each of us? So Descartes starts asking questions about our, the nature of our existence in this world and, and what we can understand about it, right? He says, maybe, he, he says, I'm going to try and doubt everything that I can. And he starts out with, I'm going to doubt my, I, I don't, I don't think I could completely trust my senses, right? My senses have been deceived before, right? Seeing something from afar, for instance, uh, you know, is this, is this the person that you were, uh, you know, talking to? Uh, that you you were looking to meet, or is this somebody else? And you might mistake one for the other uh, off in the distance. Um, 
were you do you ever remember being a kid and you're like following uh you know your your grown up around like say in a grocery store or a museum or in a, in a in a mall someplace and then you suddenly realize that you're following the wrong person that there was somebody who had the same kind of coat on as 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 your as your uh mom or your grandpa and, and now you're you're following the wrong coat. Do you, did it? Did that ever happen to anybody besides me? It's 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 a disconcerting feeling, isn't it? You know, it's sort of a oh well, there is that. <laughs> <sighs> Those parrots should have been spanked. Yeah, it, it it it's it's a little it's a little shocking, you know. Um, like you're like you know, my mom has transformed into something else, someone else. <laughs> Did you ever think if you kept following that person, you might be better off? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so, I think therefore I am. So Descartes says we might be wrong about our senses. And he, he goes so far as to say, I don't even know. I can't even tell if I'm awake or asleep right now. Right? I might be asleep just dreaming that I'm awake and I'm sitting in this chair next to the fire in my bathrobe. I like to think he's wearing a Snuggie and he's got a piece of paper in his hand. Um, and so he might be completely mistaken about his physical nature for that matter, right? And then he pushes it further. He says, well, maybe I can't trust my senses. Maybe I can't even trust my own mind, right? The My logic and my mathematics, it might be the case that you know, A does not equal A, and I've just been deceived into thinking that. Descartes, you know, he says, God could fool me about that, right? God could fool Descartes about math, you know, have him believe that two plus three equals seven. But God would not do that because God is all good. But maybe there's some evil genius, some sort of spirit that can a demon that can deceive Descartes about everything that he's thinking and everything that he's feeling. Um, and the one thing <clears throat> he comes to the conclusion in the second meditation that the one thing that he can know, even if he's not sure that he's awake, even if he's not sure of the nature of his body or even the nature of his of his mind, you know, the mechanics of his mind. As long as he's thinking about being deceived, right? He's thinking and he cannot deny that he is thinking. And if he is thinking, there must be a thinker. So I think, therefore, I am. So Descartes can prove to himself that he exists, at least to himself, as a thinker. So he uses the, the evil genius or the evil demon idea. Um, and we have a contemporary uh, version called the brain in a vat idea, which is, it's just a thought experiment, right? Of and That's very similar to what Descartes used, you know, a, a kind of uh, equivalent in a way, but Descartes didn't know about computers and may very well have used the same example. Um, <clears throat> and I think for all of us, you know, having so much experience, you know, playing computer games, um, and, you know, playing Minecraft and things like this, you know, this this idea of sort of uh, being 
a part of worlds that we're not physically a part of is is not that hard for us to imagine. Uh, let's see. Okay. Can anybody tell us what the brain in a vat idea was? Or is willing to, I'll put it that way. Yes. The Matrix was, was very much a brain in the vat idea the uh, you know the character Neo thought he was living in the world the same way that we do, um, moving around, interacting with different people, talking, making, building, doing things. Uh, but in fact, you know his body was was in uh, almost like a cocoon, right? It was it was in this sort of pod, you know. Uh, surrounded by nutrient jelly and he was all of his experiences were being pumped into his brain and uh i guess you know he was being fed uh by a tube as well all these things kept him alive um but his body had never uh he never actually breathed air you know he would have had no scars whatsoever except for whatever the machines did to him. No calluses. Very good, Roscoe. That's exactly it. Right. Who knows? We might actually be in Minecraft. I think, Emily, you brought up the idea um, the Zen koan, um, am I a man dreaming I'm a butterfly, or am I a butterfly dreaming I'm a man? Um, that's a, a similar sort of issue. If we can't believe what our senses are telling us, then all kinds of things could be the case, right? Could be, could be right. I don't think we're in Minecraft. Uh, let's see. Right. So, yes, we could be in our own Truman shows. The Truman, uh, for those of you who don't remember the movie, uh, the Truman show was uh, a television show that was uh, all designed around this one character uh, called Truman. <clears throat> and they were watching him uh, actually grow up and live his life. And everything that was all around him, all the people that were around him were actors. They were not his real parents. He had, uh, there was an actor that was serving as his wife, I believe. And uh, he, everywhere he went in this town, this was all just part of a big stage setup. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, they could put cameras all over the house so they could, everybody could see what everything Truman did. And yes, that does sound, I, I, he definitely did not consent to that. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was very unethical. Uh, he eventually escapes, I believe. That's the, the ending. As he finally figures out what's going on and walks out. Hmm. Yeah, that always troubled me a great deal about the Truman Show, too. It's just, ooh, creepy. Um... Hmm. Well, so all of this stuff is meant to kind of get you start to think about, well, what if I'm dreaming? Well, what if I'm 
if I really am just part of a big computer program. Oh, yes, Manny. Yeah, this will be just like the last exam. As far as that goes, there'll be an online submission. Um, we will have a class on Thursday. Uh, I'm just, uh, I, right now, I, I'm pretty much assuming I should be fine for Thursday. We're going to start free will and determinism. I know it's right before spring break, but uh, actually, I think it's a good thing to think about before spring break is uh, what does it mean to be free, <laughs> uh, such as uh, we are. Um, so even if we are braids in a vat, even if we are asleep and just dreaming that we're awake, what is the one thing we can know? Yes. Yes, we are thinking. We're we're at least thinking, right? You know, we're thinking about being a brain in a vat, or we're thinking about being deceived by the evil genius. Um, we're thinking, you know, are we awake? Are we asleep? And so forth. But the one thing we know for sure, the one thing that we absolutely cannot deny, is that we are thinking. Right. Um, you know, we have this direct, personal, you know, very intimate experience of having thoughts, right, of, of, of our conscious experience. And as long as we are having that experience, we can't deny that we exist, at least as thinkers. We might be wrong about everything else. We might be completely wrong about our senses. We might still be asleep, right? So the brain in a vat doesn't know for sure if it's a brain in a vat necessarily, but the brain in a vat at least knows that it exists as a thinker, that there, there is thought, there is thinking, and we must exist at least as thinkers. That's what I'm really hoping you get. Got it? Okay. Um, remember that there is the uh, PowerPoint series is available to look over. Uh, there's a recording of my lecture, previous lecture somewhere. Um, the Crash Course Philosophy series, I think, does a pretty good job with Descartes' Cogito. Um, and right. Those are, those are off the top of my head. If you if you still have difficulty with this idea, um, email me and I'd be happy to, to you know at least talk at you about it. Gotcha. So uh, all right, Jade. Um, the evil genius thought experiment. So Descartes didn't know, you know computers didn't exist, of course, you know in the 1600s. So. Um, Descartes said, maybe, uh, so he, he imagined that, you know, first of all, he can't trust his senses, okay, that, that uh, our senses have fooled us before, and uh, they can fool us again, so I can't really believe with absolute certainty that I am, well, at the moment, sitting uh, uh, in a chair, that I might not exist in this way at all. He said, maybe, so instead of saying everything that we experience is programmed into us from a computer, he said, maybe there's this demon, this, you know, God could get in my head and 
deceive me. It could deceive me about everything that I'm, I'm sensing, that I'm experiencing. And God could deceive us about logic, right? God could, could you know, make it so that uh, A does not equal A. But God would not do that, right? Because God is all good. So, but he thinks, aha, maybe we could have this, this demon that's kind of like God, only not good, right? That deceive, That is deceiving us about everything. That is deceiving us about our physical experiences. That is deceiving us about you know, our, our, our sort of mental structure, you know, our, our logic and mathematics. Um, so it's, it's kind of equivalent to the brain in a vat. So we could also, you know, the, the, the computer could be programming, you know, uh, our experiences into our brain such that we think we're having real experiences and we're not. Um, it could be deceiving us about mathematics or logic um, but the one thing, again, that we know is that whether we're being deceived, even if we're being deceived as a brain in a vat, maybe if we're completely wrong about what we are physically, about our actual natures, the one thing we can know for sure that we cannot deny is that we're thinking. We're thinking about being deceived. Whether it is by the computer and the brain in a vat idea or the evil demon, you know, or evil genius in the that kind of thought experiment. Does that does that help, Jade? Okay, cool. So yeah, just pick one of those. Um, so the brain, what is the one thing that we know, even if we are com completely wrong about our physical natures, even if our math is not working. Correct. Correct. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, uh, it's a um, it's a non-inclusive or, which means you pick one or the other, whichever one is is you find most suitable for your own purposes, you know, which you find easier to write about. Exactly. Anna, you've got it just spot on. Even if we're completely wrong about being awake and, and being where we think we are and, and being what we think we are, at least we're thinking. You know, we have this very vivid uh, internal <clears throat> conscious experience of thinking. Okay, I have no idea what the little flame means. Forgive me. I I think I get some of the smileys, but that's about it on, on emoji speak. I even watched the entire emoji movie and it didn't help. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'm not sure I can recommend the the emoji movie. And um, well, you have to, you know, explain what it means, right? So, um, so let's, you know, for example, let's imagine if I'm a brain in a vat. Um, <clears throat> that what that would mean is that all of my experiences have are programmed into me they're not real right 
So all your memories and, you know, things might not be real at all. Is, this, is that working for you, Shamela? Okay. And if you don't get it, that's okay. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll keep working on it. All right, let's see. Okay, we still have 45 minutes, I think, 40 minutes. Are we ready to start on the next one? And if you want to go back and ask questions about the first one, even as we get going, that's fine too. I'll, it's all good. Um, all right, so the second question is going to be about the problem of evil and uh, what it is. And then there have been many, many different arguments made to try and resolve the problem of evil. And I want you to pick two that you know you you like or dislike or whatever it is that makes you pick something and um, describe them and at least a counter argument for each one uh, let's see all right so what is the problem of evil Very good, Emily. That's exactly right. If God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, why does evil still exist? If good is, if God is all powerful, all knowing, and all loving, then it would seem that God should be able to and, and should uh, eliminate suffering and evil. Like, make it so that car windshield wipers are truly interchangeable. Anyway, <laughs> without multiple parts. Uh, okay, so that's what I'm looking for is a description of the problem of evil. You know, if God is all knowing, then God or God is all powerful. God truly, you know, God could do anything, could repair anything. Um, God could make it so that um, you ever had that experience? You bumped your elbow and, you know, we say that you've hit your funny bone. You know, you kind of hit that that nerve uh, uh, in, in such a way that it sort of makes this. Uh, weird sort of prickly sensation or baby buzzing sensation or whatever you want to call it in your arm. <sighs> Have you ever hit your funny bone? Let's try that on, on your elbow. Yeah, <laughs> it is not. Good. It's not pleasant. I don't know people going around hitting their elbows trying to make that happen. If God is all powerful. God, you know, created the universe and created us. Maybe God could have put just a, a little shield of bone or muscle over that. So when we whack our elbows, we don't have that really strange experience. Maybe when we stub our toes, they could go numb instead of hurting. <laughs> so vividly. Okay. So that is the problem of evil. 
um, it would seem inconsistent. The, the, you know, the existence of evil and suffering seems to be, you know, inconsistent with the existence of an all good, all powerful God. Well, let's see. Let's start on the resolutions. What are J.L. Mackey's two adequate solutions? Very good, Manny. Yes. So this is the free will argument. Um, and it's kind of saying that what sort of make makes life meaningful uh, for us and maybe even for God, uh, you know, our lives meaningful is that we have free will. This is called the free will argument um, that evil exists in the world because human beings make bad choices. Um, and we, God has left us to be free to sometimes make bad choices. Um, that it's more meaningful when we do the right thing, right? If we could have done otherwise. I like that. He chose to limit his power so that we can have free will. Without free will, we wouldn't be able to love. Yeah, we would just be robots doing whatever he says. So, one of the resolutions for the free will argument that uh, both J.L. Mackey and Stephen Law make is the idea that God could have made us free and completely good, that we just we are free. Nevertheless, we, we always choose to do the right thing. Um, that we know when to restrain ourselves from really telling other people what we think about their socks, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, we have the example from um, St. Augustine who says, uh, you know, God could have made us uh, just automata, right? We, we, we could have been just pre-programmed robots, but God made us free so that we can either choose to follow God, which presumably is doing the right thing, um, or we can choose to turn away from God, which I assume is the wrong thing. And it makes it more meaningful when we choose to follow God uh, because we could have done otherwise. So yeah, Manny, I think, yeah, that, that's spot on. Um, so J.L. Mackey and Stephen Law make a play for the idea that we could have been created free and good, uh, and naturally good just at the outset. I don't think a lot of people are satisfied with that answer. Um, there, even though if you... Well, there is definitely one refutation for the free will problem, free will resolution or theodicy, which is that even if it's true that human beings are free to do evil um, and free to do good, right? So, so that we can choose between one or the other, and this is why evil exists, it still doesn't explain natural uh, evil and suffering, which comes from you know, non-human causes like natural disasters, um, tornadoes, earthquakes, uh, volcanoes. Uh, I guess you know a meteor strike that would that would probably count as something that's that's not within our control. Uh, coronal mass ejections, um, messing up all of our radios. And it could, in fact, short out all of our electrical systems. That's a fun thought. Um, uh, 
There was a coronal mass ejection in the 1800s, I believe, that was sufficiently powerful that it knocked out all the electricity and people who were sending telegraphs on telegraph wires were, were badly zapped, basically. Um, it just happened that we didn't have a whole lot of an electrical uh, structure like we do now, that it wasn't more uh, damaging. We, I'm saying that's something we ought to think about. All right, so anyway, back to what we're doing. <laughs> All right, so the free will idea, the the uh, it, it, the refutation for it can be either that God could could have created us freely good, um, or it does not. Even if evil exists because of this, right? Even if it's a good idea, um, it still doesn't explain why natural disasters happen because that's no part of our will whatsoever. Got it? Okay. All right, so Evil exists, even though God is all good and all powerful, because God lets us be free to make bad decisions. It makes our freedom, our free will, meaningful when we can choose to do the right thing and the wrong thing. Um, it's it, when we choose to do the right thing and not the wrong thing, it's much more interesting. It's much more meaningful because we could have done the other one. So that's why evil exists, right? And 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 one of the things that we can do perhaps is to worship God and you know God has made us free so that we can also choose not to worship God. Right? That would be you know at least for St. Augustine um that would be bad. Uh So the the uh, the problem with this argument is that Stephen Law and J. L. Mackey they say that we could have been created so as to be free and always good. We could always choose we're free, but we always choose to do the right thing. And then uh, but a lot of people, you know, don't really think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I think it does seem to be part of our, you know, our concept of who we are as human beings that, you know, when we choose uh, to study instead of watching cartoons all afternoon, that, you know, uh, the ability to choose not to do the wrong thing is is uh makes the good thing that much better um but an, uh, uh, one problem with the free will argument is that it does not explain why natural disasters exist it explains maybe why human beings do dumb stuff and and make people suffer in the world whether it's themselves or others um but it does not explain uh you know hurricanes and uh, I don't know, is a buffalo stampede kind of a natural uh, occurrence? Uh, an elephant stampede, that would be a thing. Um, but, the, you know, there's these other things that create uh, suffering in the world that don't seem to have anything whatsoever to do with our will. Uh, pandemics. Okay, so that's the free will argument. Um, did we go, so the adequate solutions for J.L. Mackey were the argument that 
maybe God is not all loving or maybe God is not all powerful. So we say maybe it's the case that suffering and evil exist because God has a weird sense of humor or, you know, God does not, uh, doesn't like us all the time. Um, or, you know, maybe God is not all powerful. Maybe evil and suffering exist in the world because God is, you know, really, really, really powerful, but not powerful enough to, uh, save us from, uh, I don't know, I guess ourselves, <laughs> um, to save us from, uh, completely save us from earthquakes and, and hurricanes and monsoons and so forth. Typhoons and monsoons. So remember that there was the uh, paradox of omnipotence idea which is the idea that maybe sometimes uh, when we ask questions of God, um, they're they're not logical. They're they're things that God cannot do. But because we're human and and you know we have language, but it's flawed, we can sometimes ask God to do things that really don't make sense, and that maybe evil exists in the world because when we ask God to fix things. We are asking God to do the impossible. J.L. Mackey um, said that, you know, omnipotence means can do anything. He was not buying into this paradox of omnipotence idea at all. It's He's kind of like, if God can't do, you know, anything or everything, then there is no God. <laughs> it's something else. And that's also the refutation for both the... Um, uh, of the adequate solutions for the idea that God is not all loving or the guy idea that God is not all powerful. Those seem to be fundamental to the nature of God's or really, you know, God's nature per se, such that God is worthy of worship. Um, that if God is not all powerful or if God is not all good, then we're really not talking about the same God, uh, you know, in, in uh, at least in Western philosophy and, I guess the Western culture, most of the Western cultural experience, right? Um, you know, this this all loving, all powerful entity. Very good. Um, Manny, I, I, I like your, this is, this is um, very cool. This is in line with, um, it makes me think about Leibniz's argument. This is the best of all possible worlds, right? Um, that uh, there are bad things that happen in this world, but they have to, and that the nature of the universe is such that if these bad things or things that we think are bad, if they didn't happen, something worse would, right? And that maybe, um, you know, there's all kinds of harms and things that God is constantly saving us from that we're not aware of at all. Um, maybe there's giant planet eating slugs that are floating out there in the stars and, and God is protecting us from them. Uh, and we're just not aware of it. So Leibniz said, if God is all powerful and all good, then by definition, this has to be the best of all possible worlds. And any argument you could make, like you say, well, then, yeah, what about the Great Flood? What about 
uh, you know, 1755 in Lisbon when they had the uh, earthquake devastating fire tsunami disaster. Okay. All right. Um, okay, Jade, let's see. Um, so the problem of evil, of course, is this idea that God is all good and all powerful, but and it but evil exists. It seems like it should not exist. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of arguments how God is all good and all powerful, and yet evil still exists. Um, one idea is that uh, are, are the two ideas of saying, well, maybe goodness or power doesn't really mean what we think it does, right? We interpret things as being evil and suffering because we're limited human beings, right? So there's the, those are the adequate solutions kind of idea. And you had the paradox of omnipotence to describe how we might be mistaken about when we ask God to fix things, right? You know, that, that uh, omnipotence may not mean as much as we think it does. Um, Leibniz's arguments kind of an extension on that. Uh, this is the best of all possible worlds. So even if bad things happen in this universe uh, and people suffer, it's still the best of all possible universes if we didn't have these problems, we would probably have much worse ones. Um, the problem with this argument is that not a lot of people find it persuasive because there's many, many, many different ways that we can think of that God could have made the world better without really creating any more issues. Um, like, you know, saving us from hangnails or making, you know, bubble gum less sticky on the bottom of our shoes. Uh, that would take some of the fun out of bubble gum though, I think. Anyway, so those, those are the, those arguments. So that's uh, the free will argument is the idea that we, evil and suffering exist because we as human beings are free to make good choices and bad choices. Um, God, you know, withholds God's power, uh, Manny's right about that, such that we are able to to choose to do harm to others or to do harm to ourselves, uh, even though uh, we ought not. God could have made us to be automata, you know, to be robots, effectively, uh, that just worship God that do exactly everything that God tells us to do. But that wouldn't be nearly as meaningful or interesting unless we could do otherwise. So that's how the free will argument works. The problem with the free will argument, and you know, and, and when we talk about making good choices and evil choices, right? I think I give you guys the example of, you know, I, I, I drink a whole bottle of tequila and I suffer a terrible hangover the next day. Um, I am suffering the consequences of my own decision, right? That's, that's me expressing my freedom and uh, having to deal with it. Though I could also choose to drink a whole bottle of tequila and uh, go driving, in which case, um, I could harm a whole lot of other people, including myself, and that just seems disproportionate to the value of me having free will that I can harm so many other innocent people. Um, J.L. Mackey and uh, Stephen Law, they argue that human beings could have been created to be free and good, that we always choose to do the good thing freely um, so that we could have freedom and no suffering. Um, but not a lot of people are satisfied with that answer because that seems to be contrary to our ideas of freedom. 
uh, then the free will argument, the free will resolution, even if you think that's true, right, that we have evil because human beings are free, that still doesn't explain why natural disasters happen. They, they have nothing to do with our choices um, most of the time. Um, you know, earthquakes and mudslides and, and so on. So it doesn't explain that kind of suffering. Um, let's see. Alexander Pope, the poet, argued that what we are experiencing as evil and suffering really isn't. And that if it's part of a greater picture, uh, if we were able to see this, you know, from uh, a, a more, uh, a better perspective, let's say, we would see that what we experience as uh, suffering and evil are sort of a necessary part of the world. You know, this was the idea of discord is just discord is just harmony not understood, right? When we hear what we think is uh, clashing notes in music, um, it's not that they're wrong; it's that we don't understand the piece, right? And by piece, I mean we don't understand the music. Okay, so. Um, that is uh, Alexander Pope's argument that maybe what we experience as evil and suffering really isn't if we look at it the right way. Uh, I don't really give them numbers, Blaze. I think I just kind of, um, you know, list them with their names. <laughs> Right. So we have, uh, you know, the the free will argument. We have Leibniz's argument. We have um, uh, the idea that maybe God's not all good. Maybe we have the idea that maybe God is not all, you know, evil exists because God is not all good or maybe evil exists because God is not all powerful. I, I, I don't. Um, uh, those are those are all separate arguments. Okay. Um, if you need to go back and look at the slides, maybe that'll help. Um, there, there's two others that I really want to go into, make sure we get covered today. Um, one of them is what's called the comparative argument. This is the idea that we can only understand that the world is good if we have some evil and suffering to compare it to. Right? It's, it's um, the idea that if, if we if we never stubbed our toes, we'd never know how good it feels not to stub our toes most of the time. Um, it makes us really appreciate all those times that we don't stub our toes. Um, you know, or even less profoundly, really, uh, imagine that, you know, we appreciate having enough to eat if we know what it's like not to have enough to eat. Um, we could be more grateful and recognize, you know, how really most of the time God's, uh, the world is pretty good to us. Um, I hope, I hope the good, the world is good to you guys. Um, so we need some evil and suffering for comparison so we can understand what goodness is. Um, there's two counter arguments to the comparison idea. One is a little bit, is kind of complicated, um, perhaps. Uh, J.L. Mackey argues that even if we had no evil and suffering to understand that the world is good, Right? We would never really recognize that the world is good. It would just be the world. And 
that nevertheless, even if we don't recognize that the world is good, Mackie says, it would still be a good world, right? He says, even if we, uh, you know, there there has to be uh, an argument for why it, it's important that we know that the world is good. There has to be another reason. Um, then there's a, the second refutation for the comparative argument is what's called the evidentiary problem, which is the idea that even if we need some evil and suffering for some greater purpose, right, so that we can achieve our potential as human beings, you know, we have, we can um, understand that how good life is when we're not suffering. Or when other people, you know, we see the suffering of others and, and say, gosh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm lucky that that's not happening to me. Um, that there's an awful lot more suffering and more evil that exists in the universe than is needed for the comparative argument, right? Uh, how much suffering does it really take for us to understand that not being hit in the hammer is is a good, you know, is a good thing, right? Um, the evidentiary problem, uh, remember William Rowe gave us the example of the fawn uh, dying slowly in, uh, from a forest fire, and that uh, the fawn suffering serves no purpose, right? You know, there's no one there to be moved to compassion. There's nobody there to, you know, express their their courage by trying to save the fawn. There's um, nobody there to say, gosh, I'm awfully glad I'm not as burned up as that poor fawn. Right. It just happens that, that bad and evil things happen all the time. To animals, to human beings, even. That don't serve any of these other purposes that don't um, help us to achieve our true potential or help us to recognize how good we have it and, and that sort of thing. So the evidentiary problem, which is that. There's way more evil and suffering that exists than can be justified, right? How, how much suffering do we really need? You know, um, how many buildings have to be, you know, knocked down by storms before we recognize, oh, you know what, it's pretty cool when they're not being knocked down by storms. Um, woof. Uh, so there's that argument. So there's the comparative argument, the free will argument, um, the paradox of omnipotence idea, you know, really that maybe God is not as strong as we think God is. Uh, maybe God is not all loving. Uh, <sighs> of course, Leibniz's idea, which is, uh, um, it's interesting because it, it really, it doesn't fail exactly, right? You, you know, you could talk about anything horrible um, that's going on in the world that you think God could fix, right? You know, my, my shoes keep coming untied. Um, but, and, uh, Presumably Leibniz could say, well, if, you know, your shoelaces weren't made to, you know, come untied every once in a while, that, that uh, whether you meant to or not, it would make it impossible for you to untie them later, right? Maybe <laughs> it's the best of all possible things. Okay. Um, one more argument and then, then we're done. All right. Um, this is the, we, uh, suffering builds character idea that we would not experience certain kinds of virtues or goods unless we had evil and suffering to deal with 
right? Um, our ability to express courage is dependent upon having something that we can fear, right? That uh, our ability to express compassion, you know, feeling for our fellow human and their suffering, somebody else has to suffer for us to be able to experience that virtue, right? To, to, to show how good we can be. Um, Mackie argues that there is for every virtue, every possible virtue that comes in due to some evil and suffering, that there is also the possibility of the failure of that virtue. He calls them second order evils. So in order for us to experience courage, we have to have something to be afraid of. But we could also, instead of expressing our courage, we could express our cowardice instead and bring more evil still into the world. So um, there's no guarantee, uh, you know, for Mackie, it's, it's at least, you know, a one-to-one -one virtue to vice comparison. We never, we never wind up uh, ahead in numbers, shall we say, uh, that, that uh, we really can't achieve a greater good. Uh, maybe a, uh, at best an equivalent, which doesn't justify evil and suffering. Okay, um, so that's the uh, that's the suffering builds character argument. The um, you know we don't have certain kinds of uh, virtues or goods in the world unless we have some evil. Uh, for us to have to uh, respond to. Um, so I went through a whole slew of different arguments. Um, I think there there are slides on all of these arguments. Um, and if you so pick two. And be prepared to explain what the problem of evil is, explain, you know, your potential resolution, right, or theodicy. Is, the, is this a free will argument? Is this the idea that God is not all loving, you know, and so on. Explain what that means and a counter argument. Just you need one counter argument for each resolution. You don't have to deal with all of them. Oh, and the, uh, the refutation, the problem with the idea that this is this world, all the suffering that's in it. This is a to respond to Alexander Pope's idea. If we had a particular view of the world, we would see that the suffering we experience is in fact part of the greater picture, right? That we need this for the 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 the, the greater good in some way. Um, uh, we don't have that viewpoint and. Nevertheless, we suffer, right? If, if, if we could know something that would tell us why our suffering is necessary, um, maybe we'd feel better about it, but we don't know that. We don't, we, so all we know is that we suffer. Okay. I think that's enough arguments. If you look back over the slides or listen to the podcast or the Crash Course Philosophy or uh, my previous lectures or whatever, uh, have any questions, please feel free to email me. Okay. Um, and I think I'm going to call it there. Thank you very much for your time and your kind attention. I hope to see you Thursday. Uh, one proposal and one count. I want two, two potential solutions and a counter argument for each resolution. So you would pick, you know, say the free will argument and um, the comparative argument, and you would give a counter argument for each one. 
Got it, Minji? Minji? Yes, or Minji? Minji, I guess. Sorry. Um, Thomas. That's right. I, I'm sorry. I wrote that down on the uh, attendance sheet. And thank you. All right, I will see you Thursday. I'm going to go ahead and log off.